so uh 110 episodes we've been talking about this a lot lately it's like when i get a chance to bring friends on like you one of the first things that i recognize is i go back almost immediately and i'm like all right when's the last time jason's been on the show oops never Jason's not been on the show so welcome to the so you're in sales podcast jason noakes thanks for joining us today yeah. it. thanks for having me roger number yeah. one, 110 that's my number 110 all right oh. like one, 111 you're 111 111 i like that even better 111 yeah 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 and for those of you who don't know jason and his company Prom promo pulse i'll give you my perspective on jason who i frequently refer to as the nate silver of the promotional marketing industry this guy is all about data He's all about ana analysis, analysis of data and coming up with ways for us to get competitive advantage in the marketplace. So this one should be a good one, Jason. Thanks for coming on, man. I'm excited about this. Right? Yeah, let's do it. So we began our discourse with a uh, hypothesis, right? And um, the hypothesis is that investments in things like email marketing and digital marketing are diminishing in their value for the return. And Jason Noakes came to me and said, uh, tapped me on the shoulder and was like, let me tell you why you're wrong, big fella. So this is that moment. So we really want to try to get into how taking a, a data informed approach to your marketing can result in some improved results. Yes, is that a fair assessment, Jason? Sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. So, what for for our participants? Why don't we give them an opportunity, like to talk about your background, talk about how you would arrive at a moment that someone who is listening to this podcast today would believe what Jason Noakes has to say. Where 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 does your uh, credibility come from, my friend? Sure, sure. Well, I've been in the promotional products industry my entire career. And so I've been mostly on the service provider side. I also been on the supplier side. I dabbled in the distributor side. It's too tough. It's not for me. So I, I quickly got back out of that. But um, <laughs> most of the time I was at Distributor Central for a long, long time. I was the first employee. Uh, even before that, I wrote the first online ordering system in our industry. So it not, that did not exist. And so we kind of, we parlayed that into Distributor Central. And then the last eight years I was there, I was a president and um, just I came up with this idea for Promo Pulse because I just noticed uh, all the great content that was being produced by uh, suppliers. I questioned whether distributors knew where that was at, if they were seeing it, how they could use it. And so I started Promo Pulse out. Um, we have free tools for distributors to use where they can get ideas and follow suppliers and and get I you know uh, you know inspiration in their inbox every morning, and uh, but that was always kind of the first step. The next step uh, we've taken this uh, to consumers, and so uh, um, like I said, the suppliers produce wonderful content, and but it's just really difficult as a distributor, as you know, to 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 corral all that content to put together and and package it in a way that's um, looks nice and is you're consistent with it. And so we created this platform called AMP mm -hmm. and it allows distributors to um, pretty much automate all their marketing. And we started with email and I can, we'll talk about why I started with email. And as you know, you're for full disclosure, you know, you're one of my customers. So I very much appreciate that, but it, it just makes everything easy. So we have all for you guys, we have all the promo care suppliers, right? So we put, you know, you said, okay, I want to use promo care suppliers. So we pick that and then you upload a customer list and then you just you want to send every i think you send like every once a month and it just it's done and so um, we give you stats back and uh, you've got lots of responses and and hopefully sales and quotes and conversations so anyway that's long story short um it's really my goal is to help everyone sell more promotional products and so i i i am enthralled by technology and stats like you said so so my 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 role in this whole thing is to help you guys, you know, help you get more leads, help you um, sell more things. And if you sell more things, the suppliers sell more things and everybody's happy. Everybody's happy. Down funnel movement is one of the biggest challenges for a lot of businesses that are on the smaller side, right? So when you don't have a lot of resources from a 
headcount perspective, you have to rely on tools to be able to realize some productivity and efficiency gains in order to be able to scale your business in a way that will not cost you what it costs from a labor perspective if you to bring more people into the fold, right? So this is the classic business person's dilemma. It's do I diminish the amount of time that I have available to sell to devote to the training of a new member of my sales force? Or do I find ways to go out and hire folks to give me the opportunity to amplify the messages that I can create and then distribute to the people who we've already brought into contact with our brand. And so for me, it was a relative no brainer when it came to determining whether or not you and I should ultimately um, be doing business with one another. But more importantly, what it does is it, it creates an opportunity for you to expand the cadence of your outbound discussions with the people that you really want to be your customers, right? So, but talk about how, I mean, there's lots of ways for people to create uh, marketing campaigns that include digital and email. But So how, how does what you've created sort of stand apart from some of the other choices that people might have out there? Sure. Obviously, uh, you know, there's lots of great tools, MailChimp, and uh, there's a really nice one called Flowdesk that I use for some of my own marketing outbound. Um, but AMP just, uh, it's perfect for the distributors because it, we pull the content in and it's content from the suppliers that you choose. So you're, you're very, I mean, social good is all, you know, you have your ethos and it's, and you have only these suppliers that you want to work with. And so, so we only select the content from you, from those suppliers, right. but they're the, the suppliers are always creating, um, great new content and so every time you send a campaign it's fresh it's new and but uh it just it makes you know it, it does two things it looks great and it's very consistent so it's easy to set up what you send out is worthy of your brand and your company and you don't have to worry about it you know i say it's set it and forget it but it it'll consistently happen like you said and it stay it keeps your brand in front of your customers and it gives them new ideas. It um, it gives it may it sends them product ideas that you may not even think to present to them that may spur some sort of idea in their head because they're all small businesses or nonprofits or whatever. They're all trying to figure out how to grow their own businesses, and this get, just gives them more ideas to do that. Yeah. So we all, to one degree or another, are in the business of inbox management for all of us, right? So. Right living inside our inboxes, you know, this is this whole notion of zero inbox, right? There's a whole cult that's built into this whole idea of not having uh, anything left in there. I tend to run my email inbox more as a to-do list. Then, that's that's, and, and, you know, things that are in my inbox then are the things that I know in some way, shape or form I need to take action on. But I also have a whole section of my email that's dedicated to deleting things that I don't really want, right? So, and that is time consuming and it's kind of a pain in the neck and it's like, why would people engage in the practice of creating stuff only to have it be immediately deleted on the on the recipient end of things? So like, how, how do we uncouple ourselves from this problem, Jason? How, how, do, we, how do we not become the spammers that, so many of us hate to get, right? Love to send email, hate to get it. So how do we stay out of that trap? Well, first of all, you're sending to your customer. You're sending to people that have already engaged, you've engaged with, that know you, they like you, they they have, you know, for whatever reason, they've chosen you to, to do business with you. And so the, it's not so much since you, you already have permission to engage with them. Um, I would say it's actually viewed as a positive. In fact, I found a stat, a couple stats, um, said 61% of consumers enjoy receiving promotional emails weekly. So hmm. six out of 10 want it. And then this was even more interesting. It said 40% of, or actually 38% would like those emails to come even more frequently, which is, that kind of blew my mind. But um, so, you know, I, yeah, there's a lot of spam and I get, 
I get it too, and everybody gets it, but I do pay attention to some things, right? And I do welcome those things. And so if um, if social good is promote or is providing a service to your customers and you know, you send these emails to them that gives them more ideas to help grow their own business. I, you know, I think it's a welcome thing. Right. Right. Well, and there, therein lies the key, right? So you have to make sure that what you're sending is uh, justifiable to the person that you're actually sending it to. Right. So that it be, it be no different than if you and I were having that conversation in person, I was willing to say to you, Hey, I found this that I thought made me think of you. That's why I wanted you to know about it. Right. That's curation. That's not spamming. That's literally me right. saying like, I saw this thing and it made me think of you, or we've created an engine that connects those ideas to the people that we think are deserving of them. That, that there's where the real opportunity to yeah. provide value exists, right? That That's how you win the game. Even with, even with an automated platform like ours, you've curated the products already by choosing those suppliers, right? And so you've yeah. deemed these suppliers worthy to work with and thus anything new that they come up with, you know, you would want to share that with your, your client. So I think it works. It's, you're not picking and choosing each one, but that's, I would argue that's nearly impossible, especially for a company, you know, a smaller distributor. You just can't sit around and put these emails together. No. And well, and you know, for us and part of what I really enjoy about the way that we go to market is the choices that we're making actually have a narrative behind them. There's a reason why we've made the choices that we've made. And if you, as the recipient of what you get from us were to ask us, we would be able to explain to you exactly what it is about that particular factory that we chose. That would be the reason why we chose that one. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's what makes it the value add that we want it to be, as opposed to it just being something that maybe is a little bit more generic because we've gone to the additional trouble of being able to tell you that story because we've we've put the time in to understand who it is that we're partnering with when it comes to the kind of work that we want to do in the factories that we want to choose. So that's, you know, that's a reflection of our brand, but that isn't what most people will choose when they're building campaigns like this, which is why it creates the problem for most people about it feeling spammy. Right. Yeah. But again, it's uh, this, we don't like for our particular solutions, we're not doing um, like new leads per se. It's, it's not just getting buying lists and sending it out, you know, right. each, each distributor that we work with, these are their customers. And so, you know, and it's, they, they have a relationship with, and I, I would guess the customers expect, this to happen, right? I mean, yeah. like they they work with you. They're expecting you to give them uh, ideas and suggestions. It's you know, you know, for most products they don't, and so right. so they're uh, expecting. We say, Jason, uh, it it pe people are okay with you trying to sell them things every now and again. It's okay. Yeah. You can actually yeah. ask someone to buy something, <laughs> right? So, all right. So, uh, Nate Silver himself, the guy loves to get into the stats. So, right. let let's let's talk about. So you, you've been running these programs for a while now. You, you've been able to gather some statistics. What What is the analysis of what you've been able to construct so far tell you when it comes to some of the things that make for strong campaigns? Well, I to be I haven't done it long enough to really get the, anything good. But um, I, I believe, I mean, the content that we pull, pull in, first of all, we're very choosy in what we put in these emails. And so uh, I, you know, the, the, we have machine learning algorithm that picks out the good stuff. And then I actually curate it right now. So, you know, cause I'm a lean scrappy startup too, but, um, and so it's, it's only the best stuff that goes in there. So as far as that, um, there's no stats around that. That's just visually saying, Oh, this is good. That's not good. This works. This right. doesn't work. But, but overall, um, you know, last 30 days I ran some numbers, of course, I, I assume you expected me to do this, but you know, we didn't, 25% open rate, a 20% click rate, and you know, 23,000 products were looked at by consumers. And so it's 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 greatly enhancing the conversations around promotional products, which is yeah. ideas. And so um, some other stats that I found, you know, doing a little research for this call, I found a really interesting stat. 
from Litmus. Litmus does, um, they're kind of, a, they do email testing. They have a service for the email providers and you can, you can run your, your, your emails through Litmus to see what they look like, you know, if they're going to trigger for spam, but, but they had a stat that said for every dollar spent on email marketing, a company gets $36 in return. Wow. I mean, that talk about no brainer, right? So right. that's, um, and that's across all, that's an average across all different industries, actually marketing and advertising was $42. Mm -hmm. So, so anyway, it, you know, you, you read this, these percentages and like the 60% of consumers that want these emails. And so, you know, email still, yeah, email has got a bad rap sometimes, but it's still the most effective outbound marketing tool there is. And if it's done well, like I said, like we talked about, people want to receive those emails. Yeah. So I want to advance this, this concept that I will occasionally champion in conversations in person. So you go to a new website, we get turned on to something. So we're going to go check them out. We go out online. Invariably, the first thing that happens when you go to a new website is, hey, sign up for my newsletter or something along those lines that allows me to capture you as a lead as you visited my website. And invariably, then that turns into the dance that becomes the email marketing campaign in your inbox, right? So I don't know about you, Jason, but I have like this... Um, I have a very specific email that I use to sign up for those newsletters and it's only for that. And there's all kinds of people's content in there, right? And I find myself in this whole inbox management discussion that we were talking about, like I spend a fair amount of time deleting stuff out of there that I never even bother to interact with. But here's what I've recognized over time. There are certain people that I've signed up for their content that go into that inbox that I don't automatically delete them. I don't automatically read it, but I don't automatically delete it either. I let that content live in there for a while so that when I have time that I can use to devote to maybe catching up on some of the content that I follow from specific people, my inbox is where I can go to do that. Right? Sure. And so this idea of like earned inbox real estate is really, really important, I think, in this whole co construct of trying to do email marketing. It's can you make it be good enough so that I won't delete it? I'll let it live there. And those are the ones that tend to earn your business over time because you're not just automatically deleting or unsubscribing from those people, right? So. Right. Um, how does 20 to 25% compare to what you see in traditional email marketing statistics as far as opens and click-throughs and things like that? Oh, I think that's that's high. Um, I did not go prepare that particular uh, that number, but just I've heard number low, much lower you know, in yeah. terms of overall open rate. So I Correct. think it's great. And again, it goes back to the fact you know, if you take that number across all the emails ever sent, well, there's so much crap that's been sent out that, you know, that's going to drag everything down. So this, again, the, the, we're sending email out to uh, somebody, a consumer that has a relationship with the customer or the distributor. And so, so that's always going to result in higher open rates, I think. And um, so again, I, you know, I do the same thing. I, I actually do get inbox zero. I, you know, I'm kind of obsessive about that, but I use different tools to manage some of the things that like the newsletters that come in, um, that they already, they get filtered automatically into a folder that I can go, you know, peruse through. And if I'm busy, you know, sometimes they get deleted, right? You want to get, sometimes you got to get on with your day. And, and I, I'm the same way. I'll use my inbox as a, a to-do list, but you always got to keep in mind that, that if you do that, then other people have access to, your to-do list. So other right. people can put things on your to-do list. And so you have to be yeah. very cognizant. I'm serious. You have to be real cognizant of that because, and, you know, not automatically take whatever goes in your inbox is something you need to do. So, I mean, it's just like anything with business and life, but. Um, well, we'll, we'll bring you back for a separate email management. Uh, so yeah. you're in podcast where we can talk about that in, in its entirety. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, what I would tell you uh, listeners, viewers, um, my, my research says that, two to three percent is what you can traditionally expect from open rates. So the fact that Jason's seeing 20, 25 percent, that's 10 times the average. 
And certainly having a relationship between the sender and the recipient allows for improved statistics, but these are still, these are, these are outperforming what most people would anticipate to be success criteria when examining things like opens and click-throughs and things like that. All right. So now let's look at the other side of the equation. So email, when you think about email and lead nurturing, right, it's part of a cadence, right? And HubSpot right now, the most recent HubSpot report said that a cadence to convert a prospect to a client is 18 touches long now. Wow. It's absurd. And imagine how the average salesperson can't even manage a three-touch campaign, much less an 18-touch right. campaign, right? It's just, it's so difficult to scale because the average sales rep in an average territory has so many accounts that they're trying to break through in that these numbers are just unsustainable because you can't possibly manage an 18-touch campaign for, I don't know, more than maybe what, 10 clients? I mean, if you think about it, you got to have some tools in order to be able to do that. So where's the digital now come in on this cadence for what you're trying to do from a, not just an email, but also uh, marrying digital services into the mix as well? Yeah. So uh, as you know, we're testing social um, tools also. I think that's important. I, when when we named it AMP, stands for automated marketing platform. So e email is not a platform, right? You know, email is just one component. And so, sure. but email is still the most effective um, form. And for when I did research and got, you know, who had this idea and I started doing, talking to distributors, it was way underutilized. So distributors are not, some were not doing it at all, or most were not doing it at all. And the ones that were doing it were also um, more focused on their value add and not, didn't really talk about product because again, it's hard to stay on top of that, that product wave, you know, I mean, look at all the you know, trade shows, you're doing all this stuff, trying to know what's going on. Yep. <laughs> but um, as far as the cadence, yeah, I, you know, I, I think it has to be a, you know, besides email, social is, is an important tool, um, you know, because of the, the conversations that are built around social and it's, it's another touch point. It's another way to stay out front. Um, you know, and even your website does that too. And so you know, a lot of people will judge social good on their website. And so, you know, that needs to be refreshed and that needs to have new content and that needs to, you know, look like, there's stuff going on. And so, yeah, it's not only email. Email is the place we started because we thought we could make the biggest difference. Right. Quickly. But um, social um, for us is next. Uh, and then other tools. We have other ideas, of course, you know, beyond that. But, um, um, it, you know, you have to you have to have strategy behind it. And we've talked about you, you guys have a strategy and a plan around all the things that you do. And so. So this kind of fits into your strategy and the way that you know, like other distributors have these plans and then, you know, dropping these product ideas in along with your other um, value adds and the things that, that, that make social good unique or different from, you know, distributor B, you know, so, so anyway, so it's, yeah, it's very important and it, you, you really need, you have to do everything right. And it's hard to do everything. And, you know, you, everything comes, you know, you hear about, like when Clubhouse came out, then everybody's like, "Oh my Clubhouse!" You know, so so it's hard. You you do have to pick and choose. But the nice thing about a service like AMP is it allows you to 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 participate without, you know, having to be fully fully there. You, at least you can show up and and kind of be there where your customers are. Yeah, and to your point, the the real to me like the. The magic is telling the story in the nuanced way that each of our social channels require us to communicate, right? Because a Facebook post should not look like an Instagram post. It just shouldn't. And I have my right. own philosophy, so, but. So. But by creating opportunities to allow ourselves to express ourselves on these channels. Right, correct. You, am you amplify the work because. Right. If I can't just replicate the content across all of the channels, then that adds additional layers of complexity to my job because now I can't just do it one time and then put it in all of these different places, right? Or at least from our perspective. So 
by creating ways to build bridges to places that I can import some of that work independent of anything I have to do, then that makes my efforts that much more scalable because I can be dedicating time to the other platforms and the other channels that when I have a tool that's taking care of, say, Facebook, now I can spend more time maybe on TikTok of all things. Yeah, there you so go. I can't believe that that's where we are, but that's where we are. So, you know, we were just giving ourselves those chances, but there's other places for me to get this kind of stuff, Jason. So where where does the AI and the ML, like where where does this, where does the data engine really come into play here in ways that make your tool maybe different than what some other folks have out there? Well, the first, the, the first, um, you know, again, you picking your suppliers is, you know, it's critical. It's it, for you guys, especially you guys are very adamant. Right. And so uh, not that other tools don't do that, but it's, but the, it's important. It's, it's the engine that, of promo pulls. You know, we pull the stuff in and you get to, you get to choose your, your uh, group. But from there, um, what makes it kind of unique is because, you have a set of suppliers, suppliers create content at different time, you post or email at different times. And so it keeps everything unique and fresh. Um, you, you asked about AI or machine learning. So uh, again, we, we use machine learning to pick out the good stuff. And so we have an algorithm that pulls, pulls all the good stuff and puts it into a holding tank. And we still have a human, which is still me at this point, you know, make sure that it's okay. Right. The other thing we're doing now is um, like on your, test all the copy is written by computers and so so I, the, it makes it unique it again you have to have some human super supervision on there so because it, things could go awry but but it 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 just it allows um solutions like ours to be to give you a unique solution to give this other distributor a unique solution and because you don't want to look like everybody else right you want you want your stuff to look good uh, but you want to have your own, you know, your own thing. And so this help, this AI, it doesn't solve everything, but it certainly makes things a lot easier and better. And, you know, overall, um, you know, anything you're using now has this built into it. Uh, right. about HubSpot, you know, so I use HubSpot when I, you know, send emails out to um, potential customers or whatever. And it'll have a little thing at the bottom that says, you know, has a little suggestion and you click on the suggestion, like, hey, hey you need a uh, question or you need, you know, they give you, they help spot helps my, my emails going out better. It looks yeah. better, um, respond better. You know, obviously Gmail writes stuff for you now, which is right. great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, it does it for you, you know, it, and it, uh, Google docs will suggest better you know, clean up my grammar. It'll, yeah. you know, it's, it's that type of stuff is just, uh, there's, there's no excuse to not be professional, you know, to, you know, it just elevates everybody up. And so anyway, but that's, um, that's, what's exciting. I find, I personally find, you know, AI and machine learning totally exciting. So I can't wait for if, and when amp really gets big, all the things that I can do. You know, the data, the Nate Silver will really come out. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fun is, I mean, you, you're creating an uh, opportunity for competitive advantage. You've got a system that can better itself over time. The more people that participate in the experiment, the faster we can go. Right. So by bringing all of these pieces together, what we're really doing is giving fuel for an engine that will ultimately feed us back better and better stuff, the more that we yeah. uh, work with it to make it be what it needs to okay. be, which any relationship between persons, person to person or human to human or machine to human, like the whole objective is to try to make things better. And by having tools that we can employ to assist us in that journey to make things better, we just become uh, much more productive, that much more efficient. It gives small business people like myself, an opportunity to compete against businesses that are larger than us because we have the, the ability to be nimble and to do things that maybe we wouldn't be able to do otherwise if we were bogged down with a lot of these, these tasks and things like that. So, I mean, long story short, Jason, as we wrap up here, right? So email is nowhere going nowhere anytime soon. 
email marketing is well, it's going somewhere. It's just <laughs> not going away, but it's definitely going. It's still a viable, very viable um, lead gen and sales conversation, and you know, yeah. keep your pipeline full and all those type of things. It's super important. Which is what my promise keeper Kara Keister always says to me: We got to keep that pipeline full. We got to keep that down funnel movement going. So for those of us who are tasked with that line. I'm hoping that this conversation with Jason today was of some value to you. Jason, if people wanted to get a hold of you, how might they do that? Uh, you can go to our website. It's promopulse.io or send me an email. It's jason at promopulse.io. There you have it. Yeah. There you have it. Artificial intelligence for the win. Thanks for coming on, Jason. And uh, we will we'll definitely have you back again. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Roger. Enjoyed it.